Hello, Welland King, the host of MECFS Alert. Today we're going to be talking to Lisa Hall, who is a nurse, just retired from nursing, has worked with patients, young patients and older patients. She came to nursing by an interesting route. First, she was a masseuse. Uh, she studied alternative medicine. She's interested in what is called integrated medicine, which is bringing together conventional medicine and unconventional medicine. Is that a fair assumption, Lisa? Yes, indeed. And uh, how did you get into all of this? Well, I was, um, I was doing energy medicine and massage, and I wanted to see... What is energy medicine? Well, energy medicine often comes from Asia, and in those countries they have studied the way energy moves around in the body and find that when energy is stuck, usually you're in trouble. So how do we get it moving again and moving in a balanced way? So I was doing energy work and massage, but I wanted to do the integration. I wanted to see the integration of conventional medicine with alternative medicine. So I went back to school and I got a degree, Bachelor of Science in Nursing and became an RN. And I started working in a conventional hospital for three years. This was in Kansas, and we were trying to include alternative medicine in that uh, healthcare system. However, we weren't successful. And my daughter had just had her baby in Boston, and I was kind of like, hmm, maybe I should go to Massachusetts. <laughs> and I did find a job in integrative medicine um, in Northampton, Massachusetts, and I worked there for 18 years. And now you've retired and you've bought yourself a camper and you're going to be traveling the country. <laughs> but tell me, how did you get involved with ME and all of, all of the world of ME? It's suffering, it's frustration, and it's terrible need for attention. So um, working at the clinic where I was working, which was originally Northampton Wellness Associates, it's now called Northampton Integrative Medicine, we did have patients who had ME. Um, and as with many patients who have this condition, they maybe manage to get to the doctor's office once in a blue moon when they're well enough, and then you don't see them when they're not. So really getting involved, um, you know, having that history with these patients, working with them often by phone because they weren't able to make it into the office. Um, I got more and more involved in it, and especially as the um, Unrest movie came out and the MECFS uh, Massachusetts organization be began doing a lot of advocacy work. Unrest is Jennifer Bray's very compelling movie. Indeed. And, and the Massachusetts organization, Civics, they've changed the name now to something else. But anyway, it's the old Massachusetts Civics, which has been a very, very active chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and how many patients with ME did you work with? Over the years, oh, I don't know, certainly uh, 60, 70, maybe 100. Were you able to help them? Well, we, of course, because there's lack of research and we don't understand yet what is really the underlying, what's going on in the body with ME-CFS. So we were never able to address it directly. However, there are many things you can do when someone is tired. You can look at what's going on with their thyroid function and their other hormones. Um, what's their nutrition? Maybe their digestive system isn't working properly. They're not getting decent nutrition. What's their sleep like? Maybe we can help their sleep. Um, do they have an infection, which could be tick-borne, it could be viral, it could be a number of things. Um, and also looking at the orthostatic intolerance and the uh, low blood pressure, how that affects people. So there are ways that we can, with, with herbs and supplements and also with prescription medications, support a lot of these different conditions. And while that isn't directly addressing the MECFS, it does help many times incrementally it can improve quality of life it can improve someone's ability to function which is very significant did you become very devoted just to any cfs in your practice actually in that practice um, we see people with chronic illness of many many different kinds 
Uh, certainly MECFS has always been a, a strong element in our practice, but we also see people who have uh, tick-borne illness, uh, cancer, heart disease, uh, severe allergies, um, chemical sensitivity, and of course all of those things tend to you know, cross, cross over. What do you say to somebody when they come to the practice, or did you say before your retirement, when they came to the practice and they clearly had ME, uh, what would you sit them down and say, this is very serious and we can't cure it, but we can help you? Is that what you did and how did that go? Right, and, and of course, it's, it's very difficult for anyone to accept a chronic illness diagnosis. Um, and one of the things that we could also offer is that we could write letters, work on disability forms. That's something I got some expertise in. I had previously been a legal secretary, so it was very natural for me to be able to um, put together a good, strong letter, draft it for the doctor to review. And I'm actually still doing that one day a week uh, remotely. So, you know, we could do that. The other thing that I definitely think anyone who begins with that diagnosis needs to understand is pacing and the post-exertional malaise and the idea that if you try to push yourself, which we're all trained to do in this culture, you know, push through it, you can do it, um, you know, you have to meet the deadline, all those kinds of pushing, you can't do that if you have this condition because you can do yourself harm. You can even do yourself permanent harm. What was your advice to families? You must have encountered families, caregivers, mm -hmm. the terrible burden that any imposes on them. What was your advice to them? What was your counsel? Well, I think that it's very important to understand that this is a chronic illness. In our culture, we don't really um, think in terms of chronic illness very well. Most of medicine is aimed at acute illness. So people think, oh, it's going to get over in a period of time and then we'll be back to normal. So anyone with a chronic illness has to get that understanding and also that a chronic illness is often a roller coaster ride. So there are periods of improvement followed by dips. Just because you're going down into a dip doesn't mean you're not actually you know, making some progress. It doesn't mean that you're always going to be down there because this is something that's a terrible problem. If you start to make a little bit of progress and then you lose it, it can be devastating. But I think also it's really important for caregivers to realize, regardless of who they're caring for, but in particular people with ME, that they need to take care of themselves as well because you can only take as good care of the person you love as you're taking of yourself. If you're in, if you're in tough shape because you haven't slept, because you haven't eaten, because you haven't taken care of your own needs, you're not going to be able to show up in good enough shape to take care of the person you want to take care of. And I, I know this from my own experience as a nurse. This has become my mantra as a nurse, is that I have to take good enough care of myself to show up in good shape to take care of my patients. Some of your patients were children. Yes. Um, that must be particularly hard. It is very hard, and it's, it's particularly hard. Um, interestingly, uh, one of the windows when MECFS is most often, most often arises, is between the age of 10 and 15. Mm -hmm. So when this happens, it can often be a new onset of something that has never happened before. And of course, the parents are frantic to try to figure out what's going on, get help for their child, and as well as negotiate the school system and all of the demands of that. How do you find the schools? Uh, it varies enormously. Um, there definitely are school systems that understand a lot better, and there definitely are school systems where um, they're sure the child is malingering, that the child is lazy. I have to say, I haven't seen very many lazy kids generally. Kids generally are pretty interested in life and school or whatever's going on for them. So if they're lying around in bed, there's something wrong. But, you know, how do you negotiate with the school system? You got into medicine through massage. Mm -hmm. um, is massage helpful to patients with ME? You know, I don't know 
particularly of, of that it is, I would say that um, it depends a lot. In other words, for someone who is bed bound, it's very important to keep the body moving. It's very important to keep circulation going. I can imagine where a massage could be tremendously helpful and also relieving the, um, the stress of just lying in bed. What was something fairly happy that you encountered in your practice? Um, well, I think that it's very exciting at this time that there is more understanding of MECFS, that there is more respect for it as a disease, that uh, the advocacy work is bringing it to the attention of doctors and nurses, and that there is the opportunity for a lot more research and attention um, and understanding of this. We know there is a dearth of doctors hmm. who treat ME. How about nurses? Is there a bridge there between nurses and doctors? If we train more nurses, would that be a bridge? Um, it surely would, and I, I don't know if you're heading in this direction, but um, I worked with uh, Northeastern University School of Nursing. Actually, I think it was the Allied Health part of it. And that's in Boston. In Boston, yes. And they uh, worked with myself and some other people knowledgeable, some patients and people knowledgeable about MECFS. And we created a continuing education program which is free um, for school nurses so that to help them understand MECFS, to help them identify, oh, maybe this kid has this. And also we created a, um, an assessment sheet for the nurses to use that describes the different diagnostic criteria and also a, uh, a tool for considering what accommodations might be appropriate for children with this condition to help them be successful in school, whether they just have to, you know, stop doing um, gym class and maybe take a break in the middle of the day, and go lie down in the nurse's station and they can still go to school, whether they need a tutor at home because they can't make it to school or whether they're so ill that they can't do school at all. We live in a time of physicians, assistants, of nurses who do a lot of the work that was once done by doctors. Mm -hmm. Should we seriously be looking at training nurses just in ME? Should we have a specialty in ME and should we persuade the nursing schools to teach it? Well, uh, definitely it needs to be taught in the nursing schools. Having a specialty in ME, I don't know whether that would be appropriate. But one of the really big problems with ME in general is that it's not taught well in the, in the medical schools and it's not taught in the nursing schools. So, you know, I didn't know about it until I had been working in the clinic for a while. And it was, it's really only in the last maybe five years that I've become aware of how devastating it is. Because as I say, when you see the patients, they're doing okay, uh, well enough to get into the office. So when you're talking to them on the phone, you don't know that they're lying on their back in bed and haven't been able to get out of bed for a week. So it's easy to not understand the severity of it. And I think that definitely education of, of nurses is, is really important. Um, education of school nurses is particularly important because school nurses are often the ones who see a new medical condition when it arises. So it, you know, they're the ones who are seeing the kid not being able to get to school. Someone who was a great student can't finish their homework. The teachers are saying, you know, she was the star of my trigonometry class and now she can't do arithmetic, you know. And so they may be able to work with the tools in this um, ed continuing education and send them the parent to the pediatrician with those tools to help the pediatrician understand that this is this is ME. Um, did you have to visit any patients in their homes? Uh, no, I, I've never done home visits. Are there people in nursing who do that? Well, certainly home health nurses do that. Um, on the other hand, the way that our crazy medical system is structured, 
uh, in general, home health nurses are only going into the home of a patient who needs specifically nursing uh, care, acute nursing care. So if, for instance, you have a diabetic wound that needs to be dressed and you can't make it into the doctor's office, they'll go to your house. Um, but someone who has a chronic condition, such as ME, probably not going to get um, a home health nurse. Lisa, having seen this from this very interesting perspective and mm -hmm. being really committed to it, mm -hmm. uh, what would you like to see change fairly quickly that can be changed? Well, definitely more awareness amongst medical professionals in general and, and the general public as well, because the more that people are aware of ME as a condition, the more likely that the person is going to get the kind of attention from the doctor, from the nurse that they need. And I think that, um, so, you know, education of doctors and of nurses, um, and this was the great thing about what they were doing at Northeastern, is that they have this allied health system where they have both medical students, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and nursing students working together on some of their coursework so that they see how to work as a team. So all of those professionals could potentially be working with someone who's bedbound. Um, it could be very helpful. So that I think is the most important thing and that's something that is pretty available. That doesn't, isn't going to require enormous funding, for instance. Do you find resistance in nursing schools the way there is some resistance in medical schools to including in the curriculum this new disease or this underreported, misunderstood disease? Well, I think, I think that there is some resistance. There's always resistance to the new thing. Um, it was very interesting, for instance, I went to an event that was organized by uh, Mass CFITS uh, where we were talking to the Mass Rehab Commission. Um, and they do different things. They work with people who are disabled to help them get some education, maybe try to find some way for them to be employed. They also, there's a division of Mass Rehab that does the first two rounds of disability um, determinations for people who are applying for Social Security disability. Those folks had no clue. They had never heard of MECFS, or barely. And they, and they didn't understand the severity of it. And they were routinely turning people down for disability services because they didn't understand how bad this would be. So for them to see some of the unrest movie, for them to talk to uh, families, family members who had experienced ME was really revealing. You know, and this is, this is, um, this is something that needs to happen. And now that you're retired, but mm -hmm. not totally retired, yeah. because you clearly have way too much compassion and too much passion and too much interest, um, how do people reach you should they want to reach you? Um, so, uh, my email, I do have an email. Actually, the best way to reach me would probably still be through the office, which is Northampton Integrative Medicine. My extension is 205. Uh, the phone number is 413-584-7787, and you can leave a voicemail for me there. Or you probably could just talk to them and say, hey, can I leave a message for Lisa? And she, they would do it. Have you lectured in any schools? Um, I haven't, actually. Um, we did, as I said, we did do a, an event which I participated in and did some, some of the lecturing. Uh, for the uh, Northeastern Allied Services. And I believe there were 600 uh, students in that, that room. So that was pretty exciting. Um, but I haven't, for instance, gone to any nursing schools and talked about it, which actually is a great idea. Uh, one of the things which comes up is that how many of the young people were athletes? Right. Um, they were ahead. My co-host in this program, Deborah Warhoff, was a great squash player, bicyclist, mm -hmm. etc. Before she was uh, afflicted. Um, do you see a relationship between athleticism and, and 
the initial infection? You know, it's really hard to say. I certainly agree that there are many very athletic kids who suddenly can't do it. Um, and this, this is so interesting because for a long time, it used to be thought that ME was actually just physical deconditioning. And if you just slowly, slowly worked your way through building your strength, you could get better, which turned out not to be true. Um, but it's very clear when you have an athlete who was at the peak of physical ability, who could run for miles, who, you know, was just super physical condition and suddenly is unable to do, to walk across the room, you know, that's not deconditioning. There's something else going on there. And so I think that it's very clear, especially with the athletes, um, that they've gotten some other condition. Lisa, it's wonderful to have you on the broadcast and don't be too retired. People, okay. people need you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best.